welcome to the Career Coffee Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Urban, Certified Career Strategist and Executive Coach, removing career roadblocks so you can achieve more impact, influence, and income. Welcome to Career Coffee Chat. I'm your host, Aaron Urban. I'm a Certified Career Strategist and Executive Coach, and what I do is I help you remove those pesky roadblocks that are blocking you from getting the career growth and potential you want to see for more impact, income, and influence. And speaking of impact, we have an exciting guest for you today. So today we're featuring the Job Search Gladiator, Michael Altshuler. And he is an internationally recognized motivational speaker, peak performance, and career expert. And you are really lucky to have him on the show today. We will be talking about what matters when it comes to making a successful career change with clarity, passion, purpose, and potential, and how to land more interviews and win those interviews. Now, a little bit about Michael. He is from the hit TV American show Gladiators, American Gladiators. And that's a big deal, actually. I'm dying to know more about that. (laughs) Um, To being, now he's transitioned to being a gladiator for you, the job seeker. And he's created a job battle plan that arms job seekers with exactly what you need to know to say and do to land more interviews, ace more interviews, and how to successfully make a career change. And this is all for one purpose, ladies and gentlemen, to help job seekers land the job of their dreams in record time. Don't we all want that? More effective, more efficient, and on time. And I am super excited to introduce Michael. Michael, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yay! So I am a little curious. How did you... I, I, I remember the Gladiators, the, Amer- the American Gladiator show. Um, so tell me a little bit about that, some highlights. You know, how was that? How was that experience? And how, how did you transition from where that experience to where you are today? What, what inspired you? Well, first of all, I, I love competition. And if I had my dream come true, I would have been a professional athlete. But I wasn't fast enough, strong enough, agile enough. Other than that, I was perfect. So I decided... Uh, with the help of one of my associates in my office, David Greenspun, he brought me in a tape when American Gladiators first hit the airwaves and said, Mike, there's a new show on TV. I know you wanted to be a professional athlete. And I was 35 at the time. He brought me a video tape and he said, here's a new show. You could be on the show and you compete nationally in front of millions of viewers in these athletic events. Kind of a respawn dream, but you could do that. And I remember feeling tremendous fear. I was just paralyzed with fear but yet excited that I could do it. So I had these conflicting emotions and I said, no. And I gave every excuse in the book why I didn't want to do it. And then finally the next year, he was chasing my dream for me, which will lend itself to you if you're looking for a job, which you are now, uh, how you can do that. None of us go this road alone. We are dependent people, not independent people. We need people in our corner to help us, whether it's network, hold us accountable, encourage and support us. It's a tough road looking for a job. We get that, don't do it alone. So anyway, he helped me get this, live my dream. I ended up on the show and I love competition. And that's really a nice segue, Aaron, because Mm -hmm. getting a job today, it's not like getting a job pre-pandemic. Getting a job today, you're competing against two, three times more people. Mm -hmm. And it's not about doing a good job. Because if you do a good job during the interview or you do a good job at getting more interviews and it's not as good as someone else, you come in second place. And you know what that pays? Zero. So it's about winning. And if you're going to win in a competitive job market, you need a battle plan. Absolutely. Um, that's a really, that's a really great, um, not only backstory, and it is true as well. We don't want to try this alone. And it's not just about networking. While networking is important, there's more to it than that. You need someone in your corner. You need someone who will push you a little bit because oftentimes we don't give ourselves enough credit. Yeah, it's true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the big myths I hear, for example, is, oh, I have to apply for a job. It's a hundred percent match for me. I have to check all the boxes. You know, I just want to be a shoe in, you know, a, a perfect fit. And it doesn't work out. Yeah. There's so many things that uh, there's no perfect fit in a mate and there's no perfect fit in a job. You want to get something that hits on the key. You know, I oftentimes, whether you're looking for a mate or a job or anything, you have the must haves. These are the absolute must-haves. Because remember, it's a two-way street. 
It's you want to be right for the company and the company wants to be right for you. It's not that you're wanting a job and them wanting an employee. It has to be a match. So what are, where do you find that common denominator, that common ground of what's most important to the company and to you? And, the, and I think the best way to look at that, Aaron, is you have the must-haves. These are the foundational things. I have to have a job that does this, this, and this, that feeds me my passion, my deepest interests. That's the must-have. The like to have. It'd be great if they have this, if I work in an environment like this, or I work in a city like this, or a company that does this. And then this would be a cherry on top of the Sunday if I have these, this bottom part of the list. But you have to make a list, I think, and say, what are the absolute must-haves that are really non-negotiable? And then the like to have, it'd be great to have these, and then this would be a cherry on top of the Sunday. Right, right. Yeah, and I also find that when people try to be too good of a match, they're not giving themselves enough room to grow. Because smart leaders, smart smart managers will look at your resume and say, oh, well, you checked all the boxes. You're going to be bored in six months and leave, and attrition costs money. So what is that leads me to something which might be shocking to some people to hear that you don't want to apply for a job that's an exact match for you. You actually want to give yourself some room to grow. But for if that's shocking to you, I'd love to hear from you, Michael, what might be the most shocking thing you heard that's not only shocking but true for job seekers to actually get seen as of interviewing get ahead. Yeah, well, there's three different areas. One is, you know, the, the thing I hear over and over again as a career coach and why we created Job Gladiator is number one, and I think these are, it's probably 40, 40, 20. 40% of the folks that I talk to that are, and you listening to this right now, you're having a challenge getting interviews. Mm-hmm. And not only is that a challenge, it's extremely frustrating. And I get that. And if you're looking for a job, sometimes it's not superficially a, just a job. I mean, maybe you're going to lose your home. I mean, I take this really very seriously. Maybe. You can't really take care of your family the way you you know you should as a parent. And I know how hard that is being a dad. And and you know, you're depressed, and some of you are, and and because it's taking so long. So I get the seriousness of this. It's not just a job, and that's why I created the job battle plan. I and Aaron are committed to helping you change your life, which we realize a job and the right job will do that. So to answer your question, the first thing is 40% of you listening to this. Are, are having a challenge, how do I get more interviews? And the second 40% are, I get interviews, but I'm not getting callbacks, I'm not getting offers. Mm-hmm. What am I doing wrong? And what do I need to do right? And the third thing is, I'm thinking about making a career change, and what career change should I make? And how do I transfer my skills and what skills are transferable mm-hmm. to this new job where it really resonates with a hiring manager or a recruiter? Now, did you, Aaron, did you want me to touch on how do I get more interviews? And what's the what do I think is the most important thing that someone needs to do to get more interviews or getting uh, acing the interview and getting more offers? Which, Any of those actually would be great. You uh, tell me. Although I do uh, did see you mention something that's kind of kind of earlier on in the whole process, which is okay. I want to make a change in my career. How do I even start? Where do I even? How do I even go about doing that? How to position myself well? Um, before we even get to the interview, because a lot of us are wondering how to how to even put ourselves out there, right? Okay, yeah, that's great, great question. That's that's why you have such a great show. You ask great questions. So uh, I think, and none of us know it all. So you know, you learn from me, I learn from you, and and those listening to this are going to learn from us. And that's what this is about. That's where I call it. It's we we grew up to be taught be independent, and that's good to a certain extent. There's times you need to be independent, but we are dependent. Whether you depend on God or you depend on your friends or you depend on coaches, you need to depend on people that can that elevate you, that hold you accountable, that breathe life into you when no life seems left, when you're just defeated and deflated because you yeah, you need your support group, your your oh, personal yeah. board of directors, those people who are in your corner. And here's the thing: if for those of you who are thinking about finding a new job or you're in the search right now. If you are hesitant or feeling bad, oh, well, I'm a bad person because I'm looking for a job. No, it's not a, welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> I've pivoted my career five times and I couldn't have done it without support, without reaching out, without 
help allowing other people to help us. That's the thing. We get so caught up in that independent thing, Michael. Yeah, yeah. We don't let other people to help us. I want to say really quickly, hi to Gail for tuning in from Porter, Texas, and hi, Ken. Great to see you as well. But yeah, we don't allow people to help us. Right. Oh, yeah. Wow. And you see that. Like that barrier. But listen, life, I just did a short video. Life and business are tough. These battles are tough. Looking for a job and everything else you're dealing with in your life, I know we all deal with it. So to go that road alone, not only is silly, but it's kind of impossible. You need people in your corner. As confident as I am, I have times when I'm down and people call me up or I call people and they just breathe life into me and confidence into me. And when you have those people in your corner, I call them encouragers. You have to get rid of the discouragers. You have encouragers and discouragers. Get the, get the, discour the encouragers in your corner. I call them battery train drainers and battery chargers. Get the battery. We know who, you're, who they are, right? Get those chargers who charge your battery when it's running low. We all need that. And that's how we stay at this elevated level of performance, which we need when we're looking for a job. But I want to go back to your question, Aaron. You asked about how do you search? Do, am I going to make a career change? And if I am, how do I know what that ideal next move is? I think there's a few things that you, that you have to check off. One is, what are my passions? If I, if money was no object, if time were no object, if I knew for 100%, 100% I couldn't fail, what would I want to do the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. So think about that. That's what are my passions? Because you could, they say, if you love your job, you're never working a day in your life. We've all heard that. So what are your passions? That can be yes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> At least it's rewarding. You you work it hard. Is, right. So you're, you're not dreading going to work. I work. Sure. I work right. I work really hard. I work 12, 14 hours a day, and I work on my passion. I get to transform people's lives. Is it hard work? Yeah, but I get paid twice. One, my clients, and two, knowing that I help transform someone's life and their family, and that's wonderful. So it's that reward that outweighs the effort. And and so so the first thing, what are your passions? What are your skills, qualifications, and experience? Mm -hmm. And how do they match up? And then you, so Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People says, start with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. What is your objective? What do you want? Well, I want to find a job that's fulfilling, that's meaningful, that will be able to provide me with the lifestyle and the joy and happiness and fulfillment that I want in my life. That's the end game. Then you reverse engineer it. Say, okay, what are my passion, skills, qualifications, and experience? And then say, okay, what industries, what companies, and what positions will meet those things that I want that I just mentioned? Right. And then that's how you start your search. You target them, and then you go to phase two, which is, okay, how do I reach these companies? What are all the ways I can reach these companies? Who is my target within these companies, hiring managers, recruiters? And you reach them through networking, you reach them through job posts, and a myriad of other ways that you reach them. So that's the, the the answer to how do you get clear on a career path and know when to make the move. If you're unfulfilled, you know, by the way, there was a study done on people on their deathbed. And they said, if you had one regret in your life, what would that regret be? This is like over 90% answer with the same answer. And they said, I lived a life according to what others expected of me, not what I expected of myself. Ooh. That's good. Okay, so if you're making a career change, if you're working right now on a job that you think is what everyone else says is right for you or all these out, outside or external influences, and I'm not saying outside influences are important from the right people who have your best interest at heart, but I'm saying you know that this is fulfilling or not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And if it's not fulfilling, have the courage and the tenacity and put all the things in place I just mentioned to go after your dream and not be that person on their deathbed they said, I wish, I wish I could have or should have, and that you didn't live a life according to what others expected of you. You lived it according to what you expected for yourself. That's 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 great. I mean, that's golden right there. So for those of you tuning in, I would love to hear your thoughts on whether you feel like you're following something that's authentic and true to you and what, what your gifts are what aligned with your strengths, expertise, and interests, or are you following a path that was defined for you? because I've, I've started talking a lot this week specifically on, you know, paddling your career canoe. And if you don't paddle it, then guess what? You're just allowing it to drift down the lazy river of life and get hung up on whatever, or worse yet, allow somebody else 
to, to paddle your canoe for you, just like uh, my ex-husband and I almost got a divorce on the canoe. Maybe we should have just gone ahead and done that. But irregardless, <laughs> we were trying to canoe together. We never canoed together. Of course, he had one idea of where he, we should go, and I was trying to go something. We didn't. We weren't in alignment. It was just a big mess. We got hit, hung up on a tree branch. It was a disaster. So lessons learned from that is make sure that if you are paddling your canoe with someone, you're in alignment with that or paddling your own darn canoe. So are you paddling your canoe? And if so, is it where you want it to go? Or are you friendly trying to get upstream like a crazy person and not really getting anywhere? And Gail shared, she said, 98% uh, of everything I applied to was 100% match earlier. Um, and she learned that earlier this year, that, that was a big mistake. So, yeah, I mean, that's another myth that we, we fall into the trap of. Thank you, Gail, for sharing that. You know, we fall in this trap of thinking, oh, we have to be 100 percent match or, oh, I have to do what other people think. Or, you know, even those people who are our influencers may have our best interest at heart. We still have to pay attention to what is in here. Right. Yeah, that's that's great. And what you said reminded me my mentor was Zig Ziglar and. Uh, one of the things you mentioned about paddling and outside influences, he had a great quote. He said, there's two types of people in the world, wandering generalities and meaningful specifics. So I ask you listening and watching this right now, are you a wandering generality, letting the stream of life take you wherever it may, or are you a meaningful specific? That you are very directed in your values, your vision, your purpose of your life, that you thought through that, and then you reverse engineer that into what you need to do in order to make that happen. So, you know, there's two influences in the outside world. The outside, everything happening out there, very pervasive, very powerful, that's gonna influence your inside world unless you have a strong set of core values and a direction. And the second thing is your inside world, your beliefs, their self-limiting beliefs and empowering beliefs. Do you believe you can? Is fear of success or fear of failure holding you back? You have to understand those things and sometimes it's difficult because we don't know what's holding us back. We don't see, you know, our, our yeah, own. We're, we're blind to our blind spots, but other people yeah. are. <laughs> people come in and say, hey, listen, you need to be thinking about it this way. And you know, people push you forward and encourage you and, and hold you accountable uh, to do those things. So you're directed and you actually take action on what matters most. That's right. And it sounds like we have a specific implementer here. Uh, Ken is following his passion for new technology. And working with it, good, good for you, Ken. Go ahead. Let's get Ken a round of applause for following his passion. And by the way, it's interesting when you mention passion because passion is a double-edged sword. Okay. Uh, when we talk about passion, what I love to focus on within that spectrum is someone's gifts. Because you can be super passionate about something you are not talented in at all whatsoever. <laughs> And if that's the case, you may find yourself paddling frantically upstream. So what is also interesting is the gifts that we're given oftentimes fly under the radar because they come naturally to us. Like you, Michael, you have a gift of speaking. You have a gift of impacting and motivating people. That is your gift. But if so, but it, you probably didn't even have to work very hard at it, did you? Well, I, I tell people, I, actually I did, but... On the surface, I tell it's like a duck gliding across water to the untrained eye. It looks You're smooth. paddling like crazy. <laughs> to, to make it look <laughs> effortless. I spend tons of time, and I'm going to talk about this. This is critical. If, if you're going to do one thing to get a job or change careers, that's the biggest gap and the most important thing you should do. That if you want to distance and separate yourself from everyone else and land that job of your dreams once you're clear on what that is and why you're landing it, the most important thing you could do is your research and preparation. Mm. That's it. That's it. And I have a podcast show called Get Hired. I, I was fortunate enough and blessed enough to have Aaron on the show and other recruiters and hiring managers. And I got great insights to add to the insights I had from my own experiences. And the, uh, the success leaves clues. There's a common denominator, a common thread of success that every hiring manager, these are the people who can say you're hired or you're not. If you don't listen to them, you're going down the wrong track. So Every hiring manager, recruiter said the same thing. Not only did they say it, they said it with passion and conviction and absolute necessity that those who do the research and customize their resume and customize their LinkedIn profile and make sure that what they have is resonates with the hiring manager and is specifically connected to the job that they're going after, 
that you have to do your research on the company. You have to do your research on the person that's going to hire you. You have to know what's important to them. And that's what you have to then regurgitate back to them Mm -hmm. in everything. LinkedIn profile, your resume, your in-person interview. Remember, the number one radio station in the world is WIIFM. What's in it for me? They (laughs) care about what's in it for them, not what's in it for you. They care that you have to speak their language, their jargon, and get connected to what will resonate with them and what will be relatable to them. And the better you can do that and then connect your skills, talents, qualifications with quantifiable results that you've achieved with what they're looking for, your ability to do that, that's going to be the key, the blueprint, the roadmap. But mm-hmm. here's it, this is easy. I mean, it's simple, but it's not easy. Everyone fails and falls when it comes to preparation and research. That's your opportunity to step out, to separate yourself and distance yourself from all other applicants Mm -hmm. and have the highest likelihood of getting the job and the offer. That's what's going to be most impactful and meaningful. If I met with you for the first time right now and I knew about what your deepest passions were and what your interests were and your pain points were, and I spoke specifically to them, is that going to be more impactful for our relationship and more meaningful to you and resonate more as opposed to if I say, so tell me, I, I don't know that much about you or your company. Tell me no. The more- uh, no. <laughs> that's that's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, for those people, you know, when you talk about passion too, it's important to show up in that space you align with what I call your zone of genius. So when you're strongly aligned with where you're going with your career, you can show up so much more powerfully. And that that resonates with those people who are interviewing you. I mean, yes, for the yes, for the preparation, that's a given. If you don't do that, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. But when you're able to talk to their pain points, when you're able to share with them what the ROI is for hiring you, because onboarding people cost money. You will cost the company money and your salary and your benefits. They want to know what are they going to get in return? And that's literally almost a transactional slash relationship. Okay. It's part of it's the human, the human quotient. So how are you showing up? Um, are you being that person that they say, yes, I can know, like, and trust. I'm going to work with this person or not. And what does that look like for you? And are you able to speak relevantly to what they want to hear, what they're looking for? Not just, well, this is what I used to do. They don't care. I mean, within reason, they don't care as well, except for backup. But they want to know what's relevant to them. Relevancy is absolutely critical. Relevant. Think about ours. Relevant and relatable. Relatable meaning you're speaking their language, their jargon. Know about the language, the acronyms in their business. Speak their language Mm -hmm. and then make it relevant to the job. And and I hear over and over again from people like you, Aaron, and other, you know, just superstars in the in the consulting and, and HR space is they all agree that using the fluff words, I'm a hard worker mm-hmm. and, and I'm a team player. What they're, they're fluff words. Fluff doesn't get the sale. This is a sale. You want them to say, yes, I'm buying you. And in order to get them to do that, and I'm going to take what you said to the next level. You said they, they want to hire someone who they know, like, and trust. And what I believe is that's to go to the next level if they know they can trust me and they know they can trust Aaron, they're going to go with who they know they can trust more. So what do you have to do to separate yourself to get that extra edge? And these are all the little things that, that we offer in the job glad your battle plan, all the little things that you do, these little tweaks that different that differentiate you and separate you from the pack. They score points in their head saying, oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. However many times they, that you impress them, and it's all these little things that are going to impress them and make what you're doing uh, the, the difference maker in them saying, yes, you're hired. Right, right. Yeah, it's knowing their pain points, be able to talk to that. Now, one of the big questions I get, Michael, is, you know, what's that follow up look like? Because oftentimes people don't really know that they even should. I, I, <laughs> I had someone reach out to me and go, well, I had this great interview. Should I send them a thank you note? Yeah. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, if you want to be considered for the job, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just that, you know, they're afraid of bugging people. I don't want to bother them, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let, let uh, me share with you a few things that I learned from the podcast show. Mm-hmm. That I, When I asked that question, it's a great question, Erin, is how do I follow up and what do I follow up with? Great question. We all want to do the right and best thing that give us the best shot at getting hired. So here's what you can do. And say, I'd like to follow up with you. You can ask this question at the end of an interview. I'd mm-hmm. like to follow up with you. Can you share with me your preferred method of follow up? And when you would suggest, uh, would you suggest uh, a, a few days, a week, uh, a couple of weeks? What would be best for you? Give them some options. Ask them what they're comfortable with. They'll like the fact that you're asking a good question. They'll like the fact, because everything you say and do, they're thinking to themselves, oh, I like these questions. She would be good or he would be good in this position in the company. They're relating all your actions to how you would be on the job. So all the research that you do before the job interview, they're Mm -hmm. going to say, oh, I like the way this person prepares. They would be great in this position because we need someone who prepares well. That's how a decision maker is going to think about hiring you or not hiring you for all the work and preparation you did and how you connected the dots and tied in and, and made your key points, your qualifications resonate with them and be relatable. Uh, to the to the actual job offering. So uh, the the best follow up, ask that question, and then people remember you want to stand out. An email takes no time. That's good. But if you want to be good, like everyone else is good, and you don't want to be selected, send an email. If you want to be great and you want to stand out, how many thank you cards do you think they get? Not many. That's what makes you stand out. A handwritten thank you. Think about any time you've gotten one. A handwritten thank you card. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Know they're busy. So take that into consideration. Everything you should do should be three key words. Clear, concise, and compelling. Every communication. Your resume, clear, concise, and compelling. Your email, clear, concise, and compelling. Your thank you note, clear, concise, and compelling. What makes it compelling? It hits them here and here. Remember, people feel more than they they can uh, intellectualize what they're, 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 they're heartfelt. That's, these are human beings. So the way you connect with the heart and then the head, that's going to influence everything you send them. So send a thank you card, get some thank you cards. I just ordered some and I send it and they just know that the thoughtfulness of you taking the time to write it, put it in an envelope, put the stamp on it, sign it and send it off. That that took time. Mm-hmm. Are you are willing to take time to make an impact. That's the type of employee they want. Right, exactly. And just know that ask, you might want to ask, oh, are you, or is the company working? Or are they going back into the office? Do they have a blended model? Because that'll help you understand where to send that thank you card. Because our last year was a little tough. That's, that's one of the big practices I coach with my clients who was follow up. Thank you cards are huge. Sometimes it actually makes the difference between whether or not you're selected as a candidate or not. That is actually a contributing factor. Yeah. During the pandemic, it was a little tough because a lot of people weren't in the office. But people are going back into the office. And besides, you want to know as a potential candidate and potential future employee what that looks like for you, whether it's a remote work, whether it's a blended model, what that looks like. So asking that question won't seem abnormal yeah. or you- super nosy. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me your, can you give me your home mailing address? Right. And you can ask them, say, listen, I'd like to send you a thank you card because that's what I do after meetings like this. Uh, and I don't know if you're working at the office or not. And also, I'd like to send 100000 in cash. So would you mind giving me your home address? No, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can you, do that if they have a sense of humor. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. I, I am a big proponent of help and making them laugh, if at all possible, you know, as long as it's appropriate. Because here's the thing, we think, oh gosh, it's so stressful here. We're going in to be an interview, and and, uh, well, they are actually probably not quite as stressed, but they're still stressed as you are because a lot of people are comfortable interviewing people. They're just not. So if you can put them at ease and have a conversation, you are in, and you also get some insights that you may not have if you hadn't. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I'm such a proponent of that. I have a call called. uh, from handshakes to hugs, how to develop unbeatable and unbreakable relationships that last a lifetime. And everything is about relating and connecting. Because how a person feels, now think, I, I want you to think about this. This is a, a critical point. 
how a person feels about you on the onset of the interview, how they, what they think about you, how they feel about you will influence how they see, hear, and internalize your message. Mm-hmm. Meaning the more they like you, the more your message is going to resonate. The more they dislike you, the less your interview is going to resonate with them. And they're going to pick up on things and pick things apart. And all of a sudden, all these- They'll be looking for things. Challenges. Yeah. They're going to look for things. Mm-hmm. And that's why they say love is blind. Because we get blinded to things that are obviously not attractive, the more we love someone, because it influences, literally shapes how we see, hear, and internalize the message. So how do you do this? I'm going to give you a a one-minute exercise to do that will immediately allow you to connect and relate at a deep level, which will influence everything from the beginning of the interview all the way through, that will amplify. It will amplify your qualifications and skills and the results that you've achieved in your last job, and it will neutralize any negative things that they may think that, oh, this isn't so good, it will neutralize them because they're going to give you the benefit of the, de- of the doubt because they really like you. It's about relating and connecting. This is how you do it. The person who is interviewing you, go to their LinkedIn, find out who they are, go to their LinkedIn profile, find out, scroll down, find out what their passions are, not their interests. Interest is superficial. Passions are something that once you get someone started about their passions, they won't be able to stop. This is deeply in, in, in bed in their heart. So find out what their passions are. Find, and the way you find that is you'll see what charities they subscribe to, who they connect with as, their, as who they follow, what leaders do they follow. And anyone that you connect with, if they, if they donate to big and, and, and volunteer to Big Brothers and Big Sisters or the American Cancer Society, and you believe in that too, and you have a story about that, a short story, to connect on that and 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 right from the beginning and say, I noticed when I did the research and I looked you up on LinkedIn, hey, it shows you did your research. They want people like that. And say, I couldn't help but notice that you're involved in the American Cancer Society. I want you to know that that runs in my family. And I want you to know how deeply important that is to me. And all of a sudden, you just change the trajectory of that relationship from the very start because you connected with the person's heart. And that's the way you do it. Relate, connect, find out things they're passionate about, relate and connect to the story you have that connects to that. If you don't have a story, use a story from someone else that you know was affected by that. I call that third party relating and relate to that other story. My friend is deeply involved in the American Cancer Society or Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and he's passionate about it for this, this, and this reason. They just want to know that you understand why it's such an important cause or charity. Right, right. And if they don't actually have the volunteers up there, anything they're volunteer or, or charities they're involved in, um, check out, see who they follow. Let's say if they follow, you know, a, a big influencer, then chances are they believe in that. That's why they follow them. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's getting it's getting a relational at the emotional level, because what drives decisions? We'd like to think it's logic. It's not. It's all emotion. Emotion drives our decisions when we buy cars not logic. Even if you think you're a very logical person, it is about emotion. Mm -hmm. All all our decisions as human beings are the final decision is emotional. Yeah, there's a quote about that. Emotion is why we buy. Logic tells us why. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because we'll come up for reasons why it was a good idea. Yeah, exactly. After we we emotionally make that, why did I buy that $150,000 boat that I don't need? I don't even live on water. (laughs) Then logic will kick in and say, Thank goodness I have a a 24-hour cooling off period, a 48-hour cooling off period. But yeah, remember, emotions drive everything. And uh, that's why you want to speak from the heart and the head. And and to your point, just a few other key pointers. It's it's important. You know, business and life is tough, not only for you, but for the person behind the desk or behind the video cam when you're having that virtual meeting. And everyone needs to smile and laugh and feel better and feel and neutralize all that other negative crap that's going on in the world. Everyone's dealing with stuff. So if you can make someone smile or you can make someone laugh, it's gonna have, it's gonna be one of those positive tick marks that I really like this person. Now they may not even consciously say why they like you. You're sitting there, you're smiling. You know, Mother Teresa said, evangelization begins with a smile. You're evangelizing for yourself. Smile, man. Be happy to be there, that you have an opportunity to get a job and contribute to their company. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Be happy to be there. And for those of you who identify with being more reserved and a lot of facial expressions and talking with your hand, it's not your 
modus operandi, then perhaps you can actually verbalize. What's interesting is research is finding that more verbalizations are important, particularly during our remote work environments. Oftentimes we have to give context to how we're showing up because having a presence online is very, very important. Not only your LinkedIn profile, but how you show up on the video cam, which not all of us are comfortable with. So before we wrap up the show, Michael, what is that lingering top tip? You know, you've been anxious to share with those folks who are watching the live show now or perhaps the replay later. Okay. I, I'm going to, it's going to be somewhat of a short run on sentence, but if you're looking for more interviews and you're not getting enough interviews, what you want to do is tap into your network and speak to everybody from your doctor to your lawyer, to your dentist, to your soccer moms, to your co past workers, everyone you could think of and say, this is what I'm looking for. Once you identify that and you're clear on that, this is what I'm looking for. If you could make any introductions, I love email introductions where they have your name and the person they're introducing you to, that will fast track. It develops through that it's third party connecting and relating and trust building. It will connect you to the person you need to speak to much faster than just going through job boards. I think the current statistics are 60% of jobs are not going through job boards, but through networking. Network, I'm not saying don't do the job boards. You need to yeah, do you have to do that. <laughs> you, need, you need to do both. The second thing, and this is critical, I talked to you about how powerful and important it is to do your research and to, this is from Tom Hopkins, practice, drill, and rehearse. In the Job Gladiator Battle Plan, we have the top most common questions that are asked. Know the key points of what how to answer that. You know, tell me a challenge you dealt with work and how you handled it and what the outcome was. Be prepared with all the questions and the answers. You don't want to sound robotic. You want to sound conversational, but remember the key points to, to, re, to remember what you're going to say during the interview when it's a little more pressure filled. And I encourage people, I do this as a speaker, to record yourself. You can get a free Zoom link for up to 45 minutes. Record yourself. If you don't like the way you look or sound, chances are they won't like it either. So you don't have to be animated. I'm an animated person. You can be conservative, but you still need to be clear. You need to smile. Everyone can do that. And you need to record yourself so you see what you look like and how you sound. And that way you can improve yourself. And if you don't like the way you sound, don't worry. No one ever does. No, I, do I don't either. Everyone hates the way they sound and look. So it's okay. Just look at it to improve. That's all you're looking for. Progress, not perfection. And if you're making a career change now, remember what you want to do is tap into your passions, your qualifications, your skills. Be clear on what you want. And then go after that target market and know how to transfer them those skills over to the job you're looking for. Make it relatable so it resonates uh, to the uh, the hiring manager or the recruiter. Absolutely. Absolutely. And another top tip, since we're throwing out some really good advice here to land that ideal job, whether you're actively in transition or whether you're considering making a career move. Another top tip I share with my clients is leverage the job description, because oftentimes, particularly in the initial interview, we may not have that much additional information beyond what's being given to us in the job description, but leverage it. Ask yourself questions for every single bullet point. Do I have an example of this? Can I give a explicit example of this where I've leveraged this type of skill, where I've done this in the past, and if you can attach it with a tangible outcome, that's even better. Well asked if Michael has a podcast. And what's your answer, Michael? I have two podcasts. <laughs> yes, double the trouble. The the first, and thank you for asking, by the way. The first podcast show is called The Results Podcast with Michael Altshuler. As you know, all I care about is getting the result for you. So you hear those words, I'm hired, or, or you're hired. And the second one is get hired with Job Gladiator. And it's on all the platforms like Aaron's. And uh, all we care about, Aaron, and, I, and that's why I love about your heart. And she puts her intelligence, her passion, and her heart, as I do, behind this. That to Really, all we care about is you saying, man, thank you. I, I got the job of my dreams. I'm, I'm living my life the way I wanted to on my terms and conditions. And that means the world to both she and I. And we want to hear those stories. We really do. Yes, we do. It, it, it makes my entire week when I get the, the landings and the and the, you know, what I saw, what I call the new job notes, the new job notes and the landing reports and the thank you. This mattered. I got one just the other day. Uh, this lady landed her interview after watching one of my uh, keynotes with IEEE. 
And she's like, it was amazing. I knew, I knew my purpose. I could show up with passion in the interview, just as you mentioned, Michael. So she showed up with passion. She knew her purpose and she landed the interview. Yeah. You know? and that, 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 that really, it feeds us like you can't even imagine. And I do want to just tag on one thing that you said. And I, I, I think I may have missed it. I, I was leading to it and I got up on another topic, but I heard this from people like you, Aaron, that are experts and all the other hiring managers and, and recruiters and consultants is that what's most important. I say, get, get rid of the fluff. Hey, I'm a team player and things like that. I'm not saying get rid of it totally, but what they're more interested in is quantifiable. That's the word I hear over and over and over again. What quantifiable results? I increased sales 132% year over year ever since I started with the company. I reduced turnover. I produced this many more products. I reduced inventory. Whatever quantifiable data you have, put that up front at the top of your resume. Those results, I just came up with a quote the other day, word, actions speak louder than words and results speak louder than actions. Results are everything. So when you have results that are quantifiable, any hiring manager will be able to back into that and say, if this person achieved 135% of quota every year for the last five years, you don't have to tell them you're a hard worker. You don't have to tell them you're always, <laughs> you're always willing to learn. They know, they can figure that out. If you've achieved that, they know that you have a growth mindset. They know that you're a team player. They know that you make tons of calls. They know that you're always refining your skills and sharpening your tools in your mm -hmm. toolbox. They know all that. They can figure that out. Nothing speaks louder than the quantifiable results that you've achieved. Whatever you've achieved in your job, offer that up, present that in short stories during your interview, and that will get you just miles ahead of anyone else. Absolutely. And for those of you who may struggle with that, because I do have quite a few clients who are like, well, like, like Gail, she's, I'm an accountant. How do, how do I, how do I quantify that? So <laughs> think about it like this, you know, if you think to yourself, well, I, you know, don't do all these things that are that impactful. Well, one, challenge that because you're a lot more impactful than you give yourself credit for. And if you think, well, I'm just, just part of my doing my job. Well, consider this. If you do a great job. What would happen if you didn't? So, right? So you matter. You matter to that organization. If you met a monthly close every every month with, a, with no mistakes, that's what you need to talk about. It may yeah. not be sexy, but it's important. And yeah. if you're avoiding risk, like my husband, he's a reliability engineer. He avoids things like Deepwater Horizon. Big deal. Billions of dollars of environmental impact. So, at superficial level, it's not exciting and is extremely important. So we want to talk about these things. We want to give ourselves some space and grace, right? You do matter. Grace, I love that. And I love the fact that if you're an accountant and you say, well, how do I quantify being an accountant? Well, I haven't lost a client in five years. That must mean I'm doing a great job. Or I've saved my account. I've never had any of my clients audited or I have a, I'm well below the industry average of having my clients audited. If you search deep enough, or you were, you're a factory worker. Okay. How many did I showed up three years in a row? I have the best attendance rate of anyone. What are all the, if, if you got reviews mm. from your employer, what does everyone agree to agree about that makes you special and unique? And think about that. There's things that you do that are special and unique that are going to stand out and are quantifiable. The fact that you showed up without missing work, people want. People like that in organization. That's quantifiable. Attendance is quantifiable. Not losing customers as an accountant, quantifiable. P increasing production if you're on an assembly line, quantifiable. So just think there is things that you've done that are quantifiable. Just have to think through that. All right. And come full circle before we wrap up the show. If you struggle with um, understanding that you do matter and you do have impact and you do have results that you can speak to, lean on that support group we mentioned about earlier. When we started off the show, we talked about how important having the people in your corner truly is, having that support group, having your own personal board of directors. Reach out to those people you are, are good terms with. Maybe you haven't spoken to in a little while and give them a reason. Give yourself a reason to reach out to them and say, hey, I'm looking for a new job. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, and ask them, hey, I know you work really back at so-and-so. Yeah, I'm really struggling to articulate my value what would you say was one of my standout qualities and you may be shocked at the wealth of wonderful information that you get from people when you just ask absolutely 
Michael, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show. It's wonderful to see all of you tuning in today. And for those of you watching the replay later, don't be shy. Ask your questions. We will be notified and we'd be happy to help you land that next great job or get more traction in the interviews. But here's the biggest thing for me, ladies and gentlemen, for all of you tuning in, keep elevating. Thank you for tuning in on the Career Coffee Chat podcast. It's been a pleasure. Feel free to reach out to me. My email is coacheurban at gmail.com or tweet at coacheurban, Instagram coach.eurban, or reach out to my Facebook group, Elevate Your Career. So I'd love to learn more about you, hear your insights, and what questions you have. You can find out more about me at coacheurban.com. And don't forget, please do reach out on LinkedIn. You can find me at Aaron Urban. Until next time, cheers. Here's to caffeinating your career.